Hello, my name is John Arnold and this is PhotoWalkthrough.com, Tutorial 7, Chapter 3, The Distorted Tree. Well, hi folks, I'm back from another holiday. I've posted a couple of pics on my Flickr account and uh, also included one in the feed, if you get a feed, get the feed through a feed reader that can pick up the pictures. Um, I'm sorry I've not commented on the uh, pictures you've been posting to the Flickr group for a while. Uh, that's because I've been away um, and I'm amazed at the number of new pictures that have been posted there. Um, I'm go doing my best to go through them and catch up with the comments, but it's going to take me a little while to catch up. So, uh, so thank you to all the other people that have been taking the time to comment on those pictures there. That is the purpose of the Flickr group, is for you to comment on each other's pictures. It's not really just for me to give my opinion. It's Everybody has a valid, valid opinion. Um, so uh, please keep on posting there and I will try and catch up with and post on as many of those as I possibly can. Um, now just another quick aside, um, I bought some postcards, I got offered some free postcards from a company called Vistaprint, so I, I produced a, a stack of postcards with the original photograph that started this whole podcast off, which was the Western at low tide image uh, from tutorial one. So I have a stack of about 50 of those um, sat here in my office that I just want to give away to listeners, if anybody who wants a copy of that. Please drop me an email at um, photowalkthrough at gmail.com with your postal address and I will stick one of those in the post to you um, for you to do with as you like. Uh, another quick announcement, I mentioned last week that I was going to produce an iPod video version, uh, which I have now produced. There is now a feed live for it, and a couple of very helpful people have tried it out for me and told me that it works okay. So uh, for the time being, we'll see how many people I get subscribing to that. It is costing me a little extra in hosting to put, uh, basically the files are almost as large as the as the 800 by 600 regular photo walkthrough files, so it's doubling my hosting costs at the moment. But if people find it useful to be able to watch these videos on their iPod video, um, and remember that that means the screen size is a lot smaller and the resolution is a lot smaller, if people find that useful, I will continue to do it. Um, the link to the iPod video version of the show is in the show notes, and I will also put a post in the feed, so you can find that at the photowalkthrough.com website on the homepage there. Right, um, I mentioned in a previous show that I wanted to partially holgify this image, um, and I'm not sure that I was very clear about what I meant. I figured in this show that I would explain, um, this show is supposed to be about photography as well as post-processing, so I thought I'd take a few moments to explain what is a holger and why am I interested in what it can do. So let me start off by showing you this magnificent beastie. This is a holger, the original holger 120. It's a medium format camera uh, and as you can see it's made with a plastic body and, uh, and that lens you can see there is a plastic meniscus lens which is a fixed focal length of, of 60 millimeters as you can see. Uh, it's got um, a switch on the side that sets it for sunny or um, or dim light and in the original versions of this camera this is such a poorly made camera that that switch didn't even do anything it's supposed to change the aperture but it, it's just a very very cheaply made camera um, I think it originally came out of China and it was originally meant to just be a sort of a, a cheap camera for people to take snaps of their family or whatever um, and it's extremely cheaply made um, it's got no interlock between the shutter and the film wind on so you can do uh, multiple exposures on these cameras simply by pressing the shutter more than once and not winding the film on in between. Um, let me just show you a couple of the kinds of images. These images, by the way, came from Wikipedia. Um, I'm assuming that means I'm allowed to show you them. Um, apologies if these are not something I'm allowed to use. but. That's a fairly typical Holger image, uh, not mine I might add, this is something that I also took off Wikipedia. Um, as you can see, it's got some very strong vignetting around the edge here. The Holgers project almost their entire image circle onto the film, so you do get a sort of a circular vignette around them. And as you can see, we've got sort of a, let me just shrink my brush there, we've got sort of double imaging here, we've got a strange line down here where there's obviously been some something in the way that's vignetted it a bit. Um, we've got a very soft focus, particularly out to the edge. It's got very much brighter in the middle down to the very poor quality of the lens. Um, 
And also I've got another shot here. This is a, a triple exposure, also from Wikipedia's site, uh, also done on a Holger. You can see the vignetting in the corners again, uh, and you can see that they've just taken the same, uh, taken the, uh, three different shots on the same piece of film there. Um, you can get some really artistic looking images with a Holger camera. Uh, it's a real triumph of uh, the artist being the photographer, not the equipment. So um, they're very distinctive. Uh, and I'm not really going fully for this style with, with my, my image. Um, let me just go back to that. Here's, here's the final version of, of my image. Um, but I, I do want to take some elements of, of the Holger style that I like. Um, and those elements that, that are very unlike uh, the sharp, bright digital images that modern cameras produce. The soft focus in particular um, that I'm going for around the edge here is something I like. It's, it gets away from that digital sharpness because lenses these days have got so good, even the very small lenses have got so good that you can get some really great sharpness from edge to edge on, on point and shoot and some very cheap cameras can do very good results. Um, and also, uh, you'll have seen before, I'm a big fan of vignettes. I like leading the eye around the image. I like using light within the image to draw the eye to the parts of the image that I found interesting or that, I, or that were the point of what I was trying to show you. So um, I like vignettes. I like that soft focus, which I also use to lead the eye. And those are the elements that I'm going to incorporate into this shot. So last week we did some spot editing and a black and white conversion and I tried to find a couple of different ways of doing those things because they're things we've covered before uh, and I'm just trying to keep those things fresh. Um, this week we need to start moving our shot towards a very high contrast style uh, and this is interesting particularly because it breaks another classic rule of good photography. Traditionally you've been taught that a well exposed shot should have detail in both the highlights and the shadow areas. Uh, and that's a very useful thing to still, still to be able to do. I believe that it's worth learning how to do something well before you learn how to do it badly. Um, that means basically know how to take a photograph properly and then learn how to break the rules and change it to your own style. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan, despite the fact that it's a cliche to do various different styles of shots, I'm a big fan of copying uh, other people's styles and learning how they did those things, trying to learn to emulate them yourself and then as you go you will find the elements of what they've done that interest you and the elements that don't interest you and you develop your own style that way. But it is uh, for me a big part of the photography experience to try and copy what other people have done and in this case um, it is useful to be able to take a shot that has got shadow detail and in fact you can see on this picture there is shadow detail in some of these darker areas where the where the tree is is uh, is darker, um, but I'm going to cover that up, um, and I'm going to move this to a high contrast style. Um, I don't mind losing the detail in those shadows er shadow areas um, because I believe that it adds drama to the picture. It it gives it a style, and it helps lead the eye to the bits that I'm interested in, which is the wonderful textures on the bark here, and here, and over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a contrast layer to improve that improve that contrast. I'm just going to remove that. I had a layer mask on that channel channel mixer black and white layer that we did last week. Don't need that because I'm, I'm want the, the black and white conversion to apply to the whole image. So right with my with my last layer that we worked on selected I'm going to add, you've seen me do this before if you've been watching the show for a while, I'm going to add a curves layer which is going to pop up this curves dialog and I'm just going to press OK on it. I'm going to rename it to contrast I'm going to click on all these all these layer masks uh, all these adjustment layers come with a layer mask attached already I'm, in this case I don't want it I'm just going to drag and drop that layer mask into the trash it says do I want to delete it yes so that's just a curve with no information set and I'm going to set it to overlay and in this case I'm going to drag the, oh, the opacity is already at 100. Um, I've told you in the past that I usually make these uh, lightening and darkening and contrast layers at 50% opacity so that later on you can go back and, and drag them up or down depending on how much more or less you need them. In this case I'm going for a really high contrast style. Uh, I know that I'm going to add more contrast later on. So uh, I'm going to leave this contrast layer set to 100% because I know that I'm going to need even more contrast than that and that will come from the dodging and burning. But before um, I do any of that I need to get the layer, get the levels a little bit more 
even. We've got a very bright sky and a quite a dark shadowy ground and we've got some dark shadowy areas on the tree. Those dark shadowy areas are good but there's some elements of detail that I do want to bring out particularly on the ground and I want to just even up the levels overall in the shot because at the moment your eye is drawn more to the sky than the ground and I don't want that. I want your, your eye drawn much more to the tree. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to add a hard light layer. Um, the, let me just quickly show you why. I, I'm going to make a soft light layer. Right, so I'm just going to make a new layer there. I'm going to call it soft light and I'm going to set the blending mode to soft light and it's 100% opacity and that's fine. Um, now I'm going to grab my brush. I'm going to grab um, black as my foreground colour and I'm just going to paint in here and I'm painting black over the bright parts of the sky and as you can see it's not actually doing anything to the white of the sky it's darkening up the darker trees certainly but it's doing nothing at all to the white of the sky it's not touching it at all now because that's that's because of the way the soft light blending mode works that isn't what I want it's actually the sky I want to darken so I'm going to drag and drop that soft light layer into the trash I need to, as I've said before, hit it with a bigger stick. And a bigger stick in this case would be a hard light layer instead of a soft light layer. So a new layer again, just renamed it to hard light and set the blending mode to hard light. Now hard light is quite a considerably bigger stick than soft light. If I paint black, just pure black, onto a hard light layer you can see it completely obscures. Pure black will go pure black regardless of what's behind it. Soft light will go, uh, will alter the image depending on what you're painting over. Uh, so this is, this is a much heavier uh, effect than the soft light layer. So let me just undo that change and I'm going to set the opacity of this hard light down to 50 percent just so that everything I do is, is considerably toned down and uh, once again, like I mentioned with the contrast layer, if it's at 50%, you can drag it up or down depending on how much more or less you want of that. But in this case, I'm interested in just darkening the sky. And I'm on my tablet, just not pressing too hard. And you'll also notice I'm using a reasonably large brush and I'm letting it overlap the tree a little bit. That's because on that particular part of the sky there, it's actually a, a darker shadowy part of the tree that I'm running up against anyway. Just shrinking my brush down a little bit just to... I don't actually want the darkness to go into the detail of the tree here. So I mean, here I'm going to have to be quite careful when I'm darkening the sky. But anywhere where the tree butts up, where the sky butts up against a dark part of the tree, I can afford to overlap into the tree a little bit. That's going to help me with my contrast later on. So up here as well, I need to darken this bit of sky. I'm actually pressing reasonably hard here, so let's just remember if you alt click on on sorry uh, alt click on the eye next to a layer, you can see just that one layer. Um, and remember this is at 50% opacity, so if I drag the opacity up to 100, you can see these are quite dark lines I'm drawing here. Let's drag that opacity down to 50 again. Alt click again on the eye next to the layer to bring back the situation I had before I did the alt click. So that's brought back all the layers I had turned on before. And I'm just going to keep darkening the sky in those portions of the image where I'm just trying to level up the, the light and dark. Now I don't want to overlap the tree too much here. And if you're having trouble on your own image getting these edges without leaving sort of halos, bright halos around the edge of whatever you're painting around, Use a smaller brush and a smaller brush and zoom in. So if I want to zoom in here, and I can go to a smaller brush now. And remember, you can also change the hard or softness of the edge of your brush. Let me bring the brushes palette in and show you. Here's the brushes palette. Normally, I work with a very soft edge brush. As you can see, that's a really soft edge. Um, if you the square bracket keys on my keyboard, this is standard for a British or American keyboard. For a European keyboard, you will need to bind these keys to something yourself. Um, it, you can choose yourself what, what keys are, are good for that. Comma and dot would be a good choice, I guess, if those are next to each other on your keyboard like they are on mine. Um, and, but don't forget also to change, as well as the square bracket keys in my case, make the brush larger or smaller. And you can see the diameter changing as I press them there. Also, 
shift the squ shift and square bracket what's the edge of the brush make the edge of the brush harder or softer so that's another very useful keyboard keyboard binding to have if that isn't defined on your keyboard by default I do recommend getting some keys set up for that so let me take that brushes palette out of the way again and just to work on the edge of this tree here sorry on the, on the edge of the sky here without going into the tree I've gone to quite a hard edge brush not a completely hard edge brush that can sometimes give you extremely harsh results you do always want to be thinking about blending the changes you're doing into the surrounding area hopefully so they're not too visible it's extremely risky working zoomed all the way in like this because although the edit might look good in the context of what you can see when you're zoomed in it sometimes won't look good in the wider context of the whole image sometimes what looks like a nicely blended edge zoomed in when you zoom out because you've blended over a small distance can look like a big ugly halo so always when you've made some changes don't leave it too long before you zoom back out and check it in the context of the whole image now already I can see the, cha the change I've just made while I'm zoomed in there's a brighter part in the middle there that didn't look brighter when I was zoomed in but now I've just zoomed out and I can see the whole thing does look brighter so that's that bit of sky there and also because I've done these edits separately that bit of sky there is a little bit darker than this bit of sky that I edited over here earlier so I'm just going to go back and edit that in a little darker still and then we've just got this little area up in the corner here to do do that initially with a large brush just to get the main body of it in going down to a slightly smaller brush this zooming in I'm doing by the way remember that you can bind in your preferences you can bind your mouse wheel if you've got one to zoom you in and out very very useful and as I've said before the fact that I have a graphics tablet doesn't mean that I don't use my mouse I use my mouse all the time it's extremely useful to have both I have my mouse right here next to my graphics tablet and when I want to do anything that's painting related painting uh, I do the I use the um, tablet pretty much everything else I use the mouse for so press, uh, clicking buttons creating layers when I'm clicking on things to rename layers when I'm dragging opacity sliders around quite often I'll pick up the mouse and use that so have the mouse as well you don't have to get used to using the graphics tablet for everything you do if you can great but in my case I find it useful to be able to switch back and forth between both so that zoomy scroll wheel is extremely useful particularly because it zooms in around whatever point you're pointing at so if I wanted to zoom in on that bottom corner all I did was start by, if I want to start by pointing where you want to zoom so if I want to zoom in here zooms in around the point that your mouse is pointing at very very useful just to zip to the image part of the image that you want to work on right that's probably all my sky reasonably well um, darkened now that's quite a heavy darkening let me just turn that on and off you can see that's extremely heavy darkening and that's okay for now I can drag that up and down later if I want to let's just see that in edit on its own so as you can see that's pretty pretty heavy edit there um, bearing in mind that a hard light layer is quite a big stick it's quite a makes quite a big difference to the um, to the darkness of the image these are sort of somewhere between 50 and 75 percent darkness I would think on the whole um, drag down to 50 percent opacity and I think that's making already you can see it's starting to get that gloomy slightly slightly threatening look that I think we're going for uh, I'm just going to do one final thing before I call it a day for today I'm going to just start the process of bringing in some of the edges just to start holgifying the image a little bit and I'm doing stroke single single strokes here I'm starting at the top and I'm just drawing a line down I'm trying to keep the pen pressure even as I go down and I'm just drawing so slightly more lines in the corner slightly less lines as I go in just trying to darken in those corners a little bit 
And I'll do the same up here. It's already pretty dark in the corners. It's not really making much difference. I will do more of that in the soft light layer that comes next. But already you can see we're starting to get a little bit of shape in this. I think you can always be thinking about the the shape of the image that you want your viewers to see when they look at the image. And in this case, I know these shapes I want, but I want the light in general almost almost sort of torch round, almost as though you're, you're looking through a tube or you're looking with a torch, uh, sorry, flashlight uh, pointing at the image, just, just to give it a sort of a, a tunnel vision look almost. Um, because it, this is almost a threatening image. It's a sort of a spooky... Um, haunted image I guess I don't really have a, a, a quite a, an image a, an idea of why this is what I want from this image but this is how I saw it when I when I first looked at the shot so I think I'm going to call it a day there um, we've darkened up the sky we've uh, added quite considerable amounts of contrast let's just look at those two layers that's how it started at the beginning of today and we've darkened it down an awful lot we will lighten it again later on um, and we will add in considerable detail in the next episode where we look at some soft light and we will also start working on the blurring and the detail of this image. Um, so that's all next week. Um, remember, if you've got an iPod video and you want to watch the show on your iPod video, check the show notes, check the photowalkthrough.com website. The links for the feed are there. Um, and remember, if you want one of those postcards with the original... Um, uh, Western at low tide image. Um, it's quite a big double sized postcard. Um, stick it on your pin board, I don't know, put it on your desk, whatever you want to do with it, mail it to your mum. Um, just drop me your address in email to photowalkthrough at gmail.com and I will post one off to you. Okay, folks, thank you very much for listening. I will see you next week. <laughs>